Hi everyone, Dom Famular here, as I have been doing for these past several months during this pandemic. This has been a great opportunity to have a chance for Mapex All Access. This is so great when we say All Access. We're bringing to you artists from literally all around the world that Mapex has involved with. And this is just literally some of the greatest talent literally in the music business. I mean, it is just so incredible to hear these great artists and to hear their story and to open it up for questions if you have any questions that you want to come on and today i've got i've got another phenomenal legend and i say that word very carefully i don't use that word often but i say legend because what herlin has done in his life musically is really incredible and he's continuing at such an incredible pace inspiring people and playing with the greatest musicians of all time so would you please welcome mr herlin riley Hey, hey, yo. <laughs> it's so great to, for you to have me, Dom. Thank uh, you so much, Erlen. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I just, as I told you before we, before you brought me to Canberra, that uh, my phone is just jumping off the hook. There's a guy that's just calling me from Texas, and he's trying to find out how the link to get on to, to be a part of this conversation. So I don't know what to do. I, you know, I'm not te so technologically savvy to make that happen, but he's trying to get on, and I don't know if it's a Twitter account or YouTube. Yeah. He only has YouTube or something. You, you know what you can do? If you if you want to text him now, while, while, while we're still right here now, text him. He can go on to Mapex Drums Facebook page. Okay. Mapex okay. Drums Facebook page or Mapex Drums on YouTube. Okay. All right. I'll do that. And watch it there. We had set this up last week, and because of some technology challenges that we had, we couldn't make an episode. To have it this week is great. And I had also heard from the great Jeff Hamilton. He texted me and said, last week when we when we had a cancel, he goes, where the heck is Herlin? I'm waiting for Herlin. <laughs> so here he was. So I got to make sure I go back. I'm going to text him right now and text Jeff right now. Oh, Maybe man. Facebook page. And what else? And you can go to you can go uh, to Mapex Drums on YouTube and watch it there live also. It's okay. live on both channels. Okay. All right. So this will be fantastic to have this opportunity. People can kind of join in, and this is I try to make this as casual as possible because I want everyone to know that this is this is about sharing this information of what you have done, and here you are in. In in Nolens, where you live down there, man, there is some great music down there with some great great players. But you are right there up with them. So I want to kind of start from the beginning and just have people to understand more about your career as far as when you first started playing drums. How old were you, and what got you involved in music? Well, I don't even remember when I started to play drums. Music was always a part of my life, and. Um... The fact is, uh, I came from a musical family here in New Orleans, which I'm very fortunate to say that. Uh, a lot of my, a lot of my, my uh, elders were musicians. My grandfather played drums with Louis Armstrong in 1913 in the Waves' home. Frank Lassity. Frank Lasty. Frank Lasty. Absolutely. That's right. And so, uh, and so, he taught me really how to play the New Orleans street beats on. Uh, on you know, he taught me how to play it on butter knives with butter knives on the kitchen table, and so so the music just came to me, evolved as a part of my whole being as a person. Um, and my grandfather had three sons who were musicians: Melvin Lasty, David Lasty, and Walter Lasty, and they had a combo. They had a group that they played to get that they played, and being primarily raised in my grandparents' home, they they always came over there to rehearse because they had a piano and they had drums always there. And so they came to, over there to rehearse. And so my mother would actually roll my crib into the room to hear them rehearsing. And that <laughs> would kind of be a pacifier for me to keep me quiet. The music <laughs> kind of kept me quiet, man. So, so I was very, very fortunate in that I kind of just grew up in a musical family, hearing the music, hearing swing music, hearing, you know, Sister Sadie and, and uh, 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 moaning and Tunes like that, man. I just kind right. of hear, grew up hearing that stuff as a as a as an instrument, and so uh, and so I was very fortunate in doing that. And then being here in New Orleans, this is a very very small city yeah. compared to Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. This is a very very small city, but it's very rich in music. There's a lot of music that goes on here, yeah. and um, and growing up, I got a chance to 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 
to to stick my my feet into all kinds of different situations, musical situations, which has helped me in my whole growth and development over the years. Mm. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Listen, the fact that you had live music as a pacifier, it doesn't get any deeper than that. <laughs> that yeah. That's fantastic. So when did you start? When you, I, did you first start playing trumpet first? Was that the first instrument? No, the drums was actually the first instrument because my grandfather, as I said, played. He never played a secular music. He only played in church. Hmm. And so um, he would bring me to church. I had to go to church with him, you know, maybe three times a week sometimes. Wow. But in doing so, when I when I when I, when I was able to um, my foot was a, when I was able to reach the pedals with my feet, I, I was able to, to get behind the drums, and I couldn't wait until he got up to go and speak or do something so I could sit behind the drums and play. <laughs> and uh, my mother happened to be playing the organ and piano at the time and singing, and and so I got to play with them as a child. And so the drums was always uh, my first was my first instrument. As I mentioned, my uncle Melvin Lasty, he played with, you know, he, he was in New York. He played with um, uh, um, uh, Arnett Coleman. He played with, um, he played with, with uh, uh, Aretha Franklin. He recorded with Aretha Franklin. He recorded with King Curtis on the saxophone, you know. And so he was really, really uh, a musician who was, was making a career in New York. And I wanted to, he was my greatest mentor. So I wanted to be like him, man. And, um, and he sent me a trumpet from New York City. And uh, when he sent me the trumpet, I was about 12 years old. And I started to play the trumpet. And the drums was always, it became like in the background for me. So I, I kind of started playing the trumpet. And that was, became my main instrument. Nice. I played the trumpet throughout my, my junior high school. My element, I started in elementary school. Interesting. Went to junior high school and high school. And, and when I got to college, I was still playing the trumpet. And so I was really, really focusing on being a trumpet player. And which is which has helped me in my development as a musician because I never had I never took any drum lessons other than what my grandfather did showed me and and just the tips I picked up from around from different musicians around the city and so forth. Uh, I never took any formal drum lessons, but in in the fact that I could play the trumpet, it I, I learned how to read music. I learned how to understand form. I learned how to understand harmony. I learned how to understand, you know, all the other music, musical um, components that, that allows one to be a musician from, from my association with the trumpet. So the trumpet came, came in in my elementary school years. I played it up, up until I was in, in college. And then I started playing on Bourbon Street, playing both trumpet and drums. I was playing in a burlesque club whereby I was able to sub for the, the drummer one night and then sub for the horn player on another night. And as fate would have it, you know, I started getting more and more calls to play the drums and less calls to play the trumpet. And, the, and then it, it, the roles reversed. The, the trumpet kind of became in the background and the drums became to the foreground. Now, how, how old were you in these burlesque shows? Were you oh, man. I was 18. I was just barely old enough to get in there. <laughs> 18. <laughs> I was now, 18 years old, man. I was 18 years old, just just old enough at the time, you know, because um, it, during that time, you were 18, you could get into clubs, you can get, you can buy a drink. Now it's everything is to 21 now, but when I was 18, I was able to get into those clubs, man, and play and play those club those shows, and man, that was a that was an experience, believe me, in itself. <laughs> hey, <laughs> listen, the fact of going. From playing in church to playing in burlesque clubs, that's a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. That is, there's some great stories there, Earl, and I can imagine, right? <laughs> oh, yes. Absolutely. So you're playing more drums now. So when you say you never took lessons, were there drummers that you were listening to when you were younger, growing up, that you were being influenced by? Who were you listening to? Well, there was, you know, of course, there was my, my, my uncle, his name was Walter Lasty. He had played with Fast Domino and Little Richard and people like that. And so um, he played kind of, kind of rock and roll stuff. And also, but he was able to, able to swing. So he, he was kind of the most hands-on um, drummer that was uh, available to me. Yeah. But then, of course, you know, being here in New Orleans, there were some other musicians like Saeed Frazier, who was also like one of my grandfather's peers. He, he was around that same age. He played at Preservation Hall. 
Right. And, uh, Louis Barberin, who also played at Preservation Hall, who played with Louis Armstrong, they were around. And then um, and the great James Black, who uh, he worked he worked and recorded with Ellis Marcellus. Um, I got to be around him and, and pick up pointers from him. And and of course, you know, as I got older, I started to you know be around Earl Palmer, who's you know who lived here in New Orleans for a long many years. And, yeah, he's many years. Yeah. And Ed Blackwell. Ed Blackwell was around. I, I could kind of and Smokey Johnson, who played the drums with Fast Also, also I, I kind of heard him. And then when I when I got to New York, man, I got you know it, it, being around New York, I got a chance to, to hang out with Billy Higgins, and um, ah. and B Billy Higgins, and uh, I met Elvin Jones, man. Elvin Jones, I met Elvin Jones in London, where he 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 after one of his shows in London, man, he just I, I introduced myself to him. And I, I asked him about a particular lick that he was playing on the drums, man. I said, man, Elvin, how do you do that? He said, come here, bro. Let me show you how to do that. He <laughs> set me behind the drums and gave me a drum lesson right there, man, when I first met him. So he was a very, very warm and gracious human being, man, Elvin Jones was. So it was so many musicians, man, that, and then I also had some of my peers who I played with, you know, I, I kind of watched Lewis Nash and, and, um, and Kenny Kenny Washington, man, they, we were all growing up around the same time. They were playing with Betty Betty, Betty Carter. Yeah, I was playing with Ahmad Jamal during the time, and and so uh, you know, so I kind of you know we kind of hung out a little bit together, and, and kind of you know had, became became friends. And um, so you know, the drumming community is a very very um, giving community. Mm -hmm. You know, even 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 um, you know being being on a cruise ship. You know, I got I got to hang out with a little bit with Jeff Hamilton, and also in, in uh, my man who played uh, Clayton Cameron, who played the, the masterful brush players. Man. Clayton yeah. Cameron, a phenomenal <laughs> brush player, as <laughs> Jeff is also, yeah. Yes, masterful brush players, man. So watching them and, and hanging out, and oftentimes, you know, you 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 pick up things just from watching and listening to people, as opposed to them giving you a hands-on lesson. Yeah. So. Uh, I got to to watch Jeff and, and Clayton man play the brushes and and also Lewis Nash man they're all great 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 yeah. players yeah. and just being in that environment and you know it's it's it's, it is, it's inspiring and as I was going to say earlier oftentimes musician drummers have um have have a thing about we we we'll, we'll share information with each other you know you know just just kind of sharing because we we hardly see each other often you know oftentimes because we play the same instrument. Oftentimes you'll see two two horn players who play together all the time, a trumpet player and a sax player, or two trumpet players, two sax players, and they get to have, have, have an exchange in the band. But drummers are all, often on different paths, you know, going different directions. Yeah. And so when 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 drummers kind of come together, there's like a like a little unspoken fraternity that that goes on in that in that situation. So being around, you know, you you pick up information from from wherever you can get it. And oftentimes, man, when you when you find drummers who, who are really really good at what they do, they don't mind sharing the information. Well, they you don't, don't find it, they don't find it to be a threat a threat to to turn someone someone else on to some things that you know. Well, you are so true when it comes to drummers. We are a unique blend of of really compassionate people that want to share what we've learned, unlike many other instruments, and that's for sure. Now, listening to us right now. At his home in California is Jeff Hamilton. He's online right now listening. Uh -huh. So I want you to tell me, here you are, you're listening to Jeff Hamilton playing. Tell me what you pulled from Jeff Hamilton because everyone is stealing from Jeff also. We don't just don't want to tell him that. <laughs> what was it like when you were watching Jeff playing? What, what did you pull from Jeff? Man, let me tell you, Jeff Hamilton plays with such, such, such command and imagination and precision. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it is always clean. It's always clean, yeah. and he always, you know, the way he he, he he incorporates. He reminds me a lot of of New Orleans drummers because he really knows how to incorporate the bass drum mm. in his playing. You know, he and especially when when he's playing brushes, he knows how to use the bass drum in such a way that really accentuates the music. And uh, he's always clean. He's always not only is he always clean uh, with his with his drum playing, he's always clean in, in his physique in, in his attire as well. He looks. You know, Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um Jeff Jeff his playing is very, very clean and always always enthusiastic. He always plays with, 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 with command and uh with intensity and with with a certain kind of um swagger. 
for lack of a better word. Interesting. Great word. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, great word. Hey, listen, with an incredible suit that he wears, playing drums the way he plays, and a nice cigar, you got Jeff Hamilton at his best. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That is so great. So all these different drummers, you go along, you hear them all, you're pulling ideas from them. So tell me about your first gig, you know, where you started touring. Who, what was your first touring gig? Well, my first touring gig was a 1920s musical. This was a, 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 um, a musical that was a depiction of, a, of black acts who lived in the South, who, who, who worked on a... Um, um, something called uh, uh, it was like a southern touring company that 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 worked a lot around a lot of the uh, a lot of the black theaters in the south during the 1920s so was and, that what they called was that what they called the chitlin circuit well i guess you call it, you i guess you kind of you, you would kind of call it the chitlin circuit yeah, yeah. and uh it was they worked different theaters it was like it was a theater company right it was a, a depiction of a theater company and the play was called One More Time. And this play um, that I played in, it toured and I went to London and I stayed in London for six months. And during that time when I was in London the, at this time, I was able to go to Ronnie Scott's, which is the premier jazz club in London. In London. And uh, I went to Ronnie Scott's almost every night because I was there for six months and it was like maybe eight or nine blocks from my hotel. So I, I would walk over there and I got to know everybody at the door, and they say, "Man, come on in, man. You, you, it's you again. Come in." <laughs> so that's how I got to meet Elvin Jones. That's where I met Elvin. Oh, and that's where I got that lesson from Elvin. It was at Ronnie Scott's. Wow. So uh, that was my first kind of touring, and I, I also I stayed there in London with them for a while, and then I went to Australia with that that same group. And um, one more time, that was a show that we did. It was. And during that show, I played the drums, man, but it was no hi-hat. It was only um, a snare drum, a crash cymbal, a rat, and a splash cymbal. And I played wood blocks, cowbells, and had a floor tom. And also, I played the washboard yeah. on that particular show. So it was, it was 1920s. It yeah. was 1920s. So that was, be that was before the hi-hat. That was before the hi-hat came. Nice. Out. And so uh, that, was, that was my very first tour that I did. That was my first time going abroad with, with that show. And um, so it was a very, very great learning experience um, to do that and to to, um, to be a part of that and it, because it, it gave me a good historical perspective for the drum set and how, you know, how the drum, I, I learned from that and from my, also from my grandfather that the core of the drum set is the bass drum, the snare drum and the cymbal. One cymbal, one a snare drum, and a bass drum, and you can play any kind of style on those three pieces. That's the core of the drum set. The hi hat and the uh, tom toms; those, those are all extra, extra yeah. auxiliary stuff that you that just add on. That's, that's add on. But the core, the core of the drum set: is the bass drum, the snare drum, and the cymbal. And you can go anywhere, you know, with that with with that that combination. Boy, what, what great advice. You know, I, I want the listeners that are hearing you speak right now. And even after this interview, it's going to be, it's on Facebook and it's on Mapex's YouTube channel. So Mapex Drums on Facebook and Mapex Drums on the YouTube channel. I want people to go back. And when you mention certain names of certain artists, I want everyone to pause it and do the research and go, Jeff, you know, Jeff Hamilton, research him. Jeff, you know, Clayton Cameron, research him. Yes. Lewis Nash, research it. I mean, these are, these are great, great players, so it's great advice that you're giving. So you're doing this touring, you're starting to get out now, you're traveling, and you realize, man, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is it. I love this. Absolutely. You know, and uh, I had the confidence from my uncles who played before me that I could be a professional musician, mm. you know, um, and it just so happened that I happened to, to, to be – pretty good at what I'm doing. So people started calling me to, 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 to work certain gigs, but I have to be honest with you. It wasn't always that way. Yeah. Um, when I first started, when I said when I was 18, I played in the burlesque clubs. Yeah, I did that for a while, but then when that, when that gig folded, I was kind of scrambling around New Orleans, trying to find out, you know, trying to take whatever gig that was coming my way. And so there was, there was a certain point that, um, you know, I was married at the time. I was, you know, I got married when I was very, very young. 
I was 18 when I married, put it to you that way. I was just wow. that's young. And I'm still married to the same lady right now, my wife. We're, we're, we're still married after 45 years. Holy mackerel. That's Listen, there's no trophy big enough for your wife. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> but I have to be, you know, I, 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 she hates when I tell this story. But, um, you know, during, during, during the early years, you know, there were some times where, where, where gigs were very, very slow. Yeah. And uh, during those years, man, she said, you know, her, I'm reading in the paper here and um, they can, you know, they're, they're looking for someone to, to kind of manage in the produce section at, at the local supermarket, you know, Schwagman's at the time. And I looked at her, I said, you know what? I said, you know, I'm a musician. I said, I, I'm, a, I'm a musician. I, I know I can be a musician. And uh, if, if you know, you want you want that that gig down there at the at the produce at the supermarket, why don't you go and apply for it? I'm, <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying to be a musician. And when I when I when this music thing when it when it when it fizzles out and I, and I can't do it anymore, I'm not above going and get a day job or going right. to find something to do. But let me I'm got I have to try this. I have to really really exhaust this the possibility of being a musician. I have to exhaust that first. So I did, man, and I stuck to it. And I had the confidence to do that because of my uncles who were musicians before me. And, and I knew, I said, well, if they could do it, I could do it too. And so, uh, and I stuck to it. I stuck with it, stuck with it over the years. Sometimes it was, it was you know, it was, sometimes it was feast, sometimes it was, it was a famine, yeah. you know. But um, you go through ups and downs in this business, you know, where, where, where gigs are plentiful and sometimes they're not. And so, uh, and but fortunately, I've been I've maintained uh, consistency over the years. I've never had another job, and I've been I've, I've been a musician the whole time of my marriage in my life, and um, it's been very very good to me. I've been I feel like I've been very very blessed to have to have had a career doing something that I enjoy doing, something that I have a passion for, and um, and some kind of, somehow somehow another another, I figured out how to get paid for it. <laughs> well, you know, I love your your humility, Herlin, because you are a monster player. Your feel and just the way you approach the drum set and the way you just swing your tail off is is, is that in itself is a whole other understanding of just how you how you phrase things and musically how you pull the sounds out of the drum set. It really is very very exciting. And you know, listen. Having a wife like that as, as myself too, you know, someone that will support us for what we do, and the fact that we're still doing it—that's pretty amazing. It really is. It really is, man. It really is. And I, I, I'm very, very, I'm very grateful and blessed to have a wife that that supported. Because oftentimes I was on the road, you know, traveling around. You know, I spent I spent more time on the road than I did at home. Did, during this pandemic, this is the longest I've been home yeah. consistently. In 45 years. <laughs> so, you know, but but my wife has been, the you know, the mortar that kept all the bricks together. I, we have five children. We have five children. We have 11. I have 11 grandchildren. Wow. And my house is like Grand Central Station. <laughs> Everybody is coming. All the kids, all the grandchildren, they're always coming to the house. And my wife is, the, she, she's always here. She's, you know, make sure that everybody's eating, make sure that everybody, you know, is doing what they're supposed to do. And and during my life, during my, my young younger life, my kids were younger. She was the one that made sure that they got to to basketball practice or, or, or to debate teams or whatever they were doing, uh, track practice or yeah. whatever they were doing. She was the one that was she was a consistent parent that was always there and making sure that everything ran as as it was supposed to. Not only did she do that, she took care of the house and the bills and everything that that went on in the house. And every time I went out went on the road and I came back. My, my house and everything in my house was very, very solid. And it's because of my wife. I have to give her the credit. Boy, well, if she has a single sister, let me know, because I got a bunch of drummers that are looking to, <laughs> to have someone like that in their life, for sure. Uh, well, she was an only child, so I'm, you had to luck with that. <laughs> Boy, you lucked out on that one, for yeah. sure. Well, now, so here you are now. You play with this 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 review that you go out and play. When did Ahmad, Ahmad Jamal come in? How'd, how'd that all come come together? Well, Ahmad Jamal came into my life in 1982. Um, he was he was here in New Orleans at a place called the the, um, the Roosevelt Hotel, and in the Roosevelt Hotel they had a, 
a, a, a, um, a large venue, a room that they call the Blue Room. And in the Blue Room, they would bring in national acts from around the country. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so Ella Fitzgerald played there. Lena Horne was there. Joe Williams. Um, and um, Ahmad Jamal happened to be playing there one week. And during that week, the drummer that played with him, his name was Peyton Crosley. Yeah. Peyton Crosley had to he left he left the gig because his you know his wife was having a baby and he wanted to be be home and be be with his you know with his wife and his child you know and so um, during that time um, Ahmad Jamal he asked a friend of his who he who had known from Chicago his name was Emory Thompson and his his um, his Muslim he was a Muslim his name his Muslim name was Umar Sharif. So they had known Ahmad and Umar Sharif. They knew they known each other from Chicago, from being from living in Chicago together. So when he came down, Emory was in the he was the trumpet player that played in the big band, and so Ahmad asked Emory or uh, Umar, who's a drummer in town that could perhaps fit and play with my band? So uh, Umar said, I got just the guy for you. And so he called me. He called me about seven thirty in the morning. I said, man, he said, he, I said, hello. He said, this is Umar, this is Emory Thompson. That's what he called it. That was his Christian name. Emory Thompson. This is Emory Thompson. He said, um, he said, Omar, he said, he said, Ahmad Jamal needs you. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Ahmad Jamal needs you. His drummer is, le is left town and he wants to know if you would want, want to play with him. I said, man, don't kid me, man. It's too, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> you're kidding around. He said, no, man, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. Ahmad Jamal wants you to play in his band. So he said, I said, well, okay, well, let me, let's, you know, he said, well, is it okay if I give him your number? So I said, sure, give him the number. So he gave him the number. About 20 minutes later, Ahmad calls me. He said, Mr. Riley, Mr. Riley. I said, yes, sir. He said, this is, uh, this is Ahmad Jamal. And uh, I want you to know, I understand that you're a very good drummer. And I'd like you, like to know if you'd be interested in playing with me. And I was like, absolutely. Absolutely, yes, sir. So he said, "Well, can you can you fly to Phoenix, Arizona, today? <laughs> today? <laughs> this is not, by then it's about quarter to eight or so." And um, I said, "Well, what time is the flight?" He said, "Well, we can get you a flight at about one o'clock." I was like, "Wow, this this is about five hours later." I said, "Well, my goodness." Sure. So during that time, you know, we could we just buy a ticket and get on a flight. There was no TSA. Yeah. There was no kind of uh, security. You just yeah. walk, yeah. like you know, like OJ Simpson. You could run through the airport, <laughs> hop over the bags, and get get to the flight. So anyway, I jumped on the flight, man. Went to Phoenix, Arizona that day. That's very same day, and I, I uh, we played the sound check. After about two tunes, he said, "Okay, that's it." So we played the gig that night. And uh, after the gig, he he came after the, that that first set. He offered me the gig to work with him, and so uh, I joined him in 1982, and I stayed with him on that particular run until 1987. And uh, and then after that, I left and played with Winston for about 17 years. Yeah, and rejoined Ahmad Jamal in in 2009, and I played with him up until just uh, just before the pandemic. He was he's he's playing up until just before he's now retired. He just turned ninety one years old, okay. and uh, and and up until about two years ago, man, he could still fire the piano up, man, with left oh. hand, left hand or right hand. He played with intensity, played with a lot of fire and energy, and I mean, and it was amazing to me a man at eighty nine or ninety years old could still have that kind of fire and that kind of intensity and that kind of uh, you know passion for for music. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had two associates, and I'm still in touch with him. I still call him. I talk to him maybe twice a month or so. We talk yeah. and we sit down, and we, we, when we get on the phone, man, we are always on the phone for at least an hour or so. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's it's very enlightening, very great to talk to. Him. We hard, we hardly talk about music. We just talk about life. We don't talk about music, at, you know, very much at all. We just talk about life and, and you know in 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 the joy of of. Uh, of of knowing each other we just talk about that but that really is what what makes it so great about how you play you know you you, you relate to people to the core of humanity and you get right down to the to the to the, the center of someone's soul 
and you find their music and you play it. I mean, it's so great. I mean, Ahmad Jamal, I want everyone to understand, if you're not familiar with Ahmad Jamal, go out and pick up as many recordings as you can. It's He's just such a happy player. Yeah. You know, he's just a happy player. And and if I remember the, the song Points the Anna, Yes. One of his big tunes. That tune was just so great the way, the way you know, and, and how you played it. You just kind of allowed the song to build. And it was just so great to hear Ahmad play the changes. And it was just such a great... Uh, just a great blend. So, who else was on that on, on those early tours with Ahmad? Well, um, you mean on, on that on that particular recording of Point Seattle? Or yeah. Well, well, first of all, on the tour when you first went out there and toured, who was who was playing with well, the live? The band? tour, the tour, most most of the tour was was um, James Kamak, who played basically played with Ahmad for like for 20, 27, 30 years or something time. like that for a long time. Yeah. He, he joined he joined the band when I uh, I joined in eighty two. He came in like in eighty three. And he, he stayed with him for the whole duration. Wow. And uh, so James Kamak on bass and Manola Padrina. Manola Padrina played the percussion. Percussion, yes. Percussion. And, wow. Uh, Great so, percussionist. Wow. And so there, there, there's, some, there's some footage that we have on YouTube um, with Ahmad Jamal and Manola Padrina and James Kamak and myself. And uh, that's that's very very refreshing. Sometimes I go back and just look at it and just 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 to, I, I hardly ever watch myself on YouTube or watch any of that stuff, but I do tune in every now and then to the recording I did with Amaj Jamal, and that was and and, and that's we did that's Point Siena. I tuned into Point Siena specifically. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you about Point Siena. Point Siena was 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 um, Amaj's biggest hit, hmm. and that hit. He he recorded that at, at live at the club Alhambra in Chicago, hmm. and um, the drummer who played on that was well, the bass player was Israel Crosby, and yeah. the drummer was was uh, um, 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 uh, man, I think. Vernell Fournier. Vernell Fournier, thank you so much. I couldn't think of it either. Yes. Well, Vernell was was yes, and you know, and that was the first time I heard someone playing on the bell of a cymbal on the off beats. Yes. And, and and you know that and then and having that control to play just the all piece on the bell, but that bam boom boom, that bam boom boom, just that feel was just such a a great cushion to listen to. Well, yes, but you know I have to I have to be honest with you that that feeling is and what he what he created for the, on the drum set with that is directly associated with New Orleans street beats hmm. and the brass band of New Orleans. So that's why. I was, you know, kind of like a fit for Ahmad to play play in that band because yeah. of what Vernell had created from being from New Orleans. He he was from New Orleans as well, Interesting. and his association with the brass bands, the brass band style, and that's what that you know that's that's what the brass bands do. Boom, 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 boom. That's why you have that offbeat thing on the on the on the um on the on the bell of the cymbal like that, and there, all the other stuff going on underneath. That's directly associated with the New Orleans brass bands, and so, um, and so, when I when I joined the band, it was a natural fit for me to play that particular style and that, that particular tune and that particular style, and with, with 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 you know with ease, because of my association with being here in New Orleans and, and playing in the brass band setting. Well, that makes so much sense with Bernard, you know, Bernard from you coming from New Orleans, man. That, 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 it, it all starts to make sense now. That's just so great. That, so you were really a natural fit to be in that band. Yes, 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 yes. Boy, how incredible. So what? So now you're, you, you're with Amalia. So then where did the relationship with Winton come in? Well, the relationship with Winton is, uh, is very interesting. As I talk about the brass band settings, um, I was – Went to the, we played in a band together called the, the Fairview Baptist Church Christian Band. Mm. Now, this band was a band that was made up of all kids from about eight till about 18. And mm. this was my, during my years as, as playing the trumpet. So right. um, the band was made up, was formed, was put together by a, a legendary banjo player. His name was banjo and guitarist. His name was Mr. Danny Barker. Danny Barker was from New Orleans. He moved to New York in 1930, and he played with Cab Calloway, with Billy Holiday, like people like Billy Eckstein, Milt Hinton. He played with all these people. So yeah. in the 70s, he retired and came back to New Orleans and formed this band of all kids. So yeah. Winston and I, we didn't know it at the time, but 
you know, we, we're both a part of the band. So when I got to play in his band, he said, Ben, oh, were you ever in the Fairview band? I said, yes, I was there. He said, I said, were you there? He said, yes, I was there. He said, I said, I never saw you there, Winter. He said, I never saw you there either, Herlin. So, <laughs> so we kind of had this kind of debate about whether or not we was associated with the band. And then someone came up with a picture, showed us a picture where we both were playing together. I was about, I guess I'm about 12, and Winton is about maybe nine. Oh yeah, my God. Eight or nine, something like that. So I'm, I'm, I was a little taller than him, and we're both playing the trumpet at the same time. Oh, that's just, and you didn't know each other at that we point. Didn't know each, we didn't know I each other. play the no. same instrument. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, when, when, kid, when kids are, are, are four, three or four years apart, they don't really associate it with, with the younger ones. You know, the, the older ones don't associate with the younger ones, and, you know, unless it's something. So we didn't, we didn't associate with each other at that time. And then, and so, uh, so we, so the picture came up, and that was the proof right there in the photo that we were there together. Oh, that's and so. So I'm going to fast forward to you. Um, um, in 1981, I saw Winton at Ronnie Scott's playing with Art Blakey, and so, uh, and so I knew who Winton was because I had already played with his dad, I had played with Ellis Marcellus here in New Orleans, and Winton had had kind of left New Orleans and went to New York. And I was still around, hanging around New Orleans trying to make gigs, trying to just do whatever I could do. And so I was playing with his dad, and his dad was a side man, just like I was, playing with this guy named his Teddy Riley. So <laughs> we, were all, we were all playing together. And so uh, his dad, Ellis, talked about his sons who were, were musicians, Branford and Winton. And I was like, really? And so when, when Winton kind of exploded on the scene, I said, I said to Ellis, man, is that the son you were talking about? He said, yeah, man, that's him. That's him. That's, the, that's one of them anyway. That's one of them. That's one of them, yeah. That's one of them. And so uh, so it was it was phenomenal. And then, um, so I had met Winton in, 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 uh, at Ronnie Scott's. That's when we first met as men and to know each other as, you know, now we, now he, he knew who I was from my reputation of being in New Orleans. And I also knew who he was because of his dad and that kind of thing. So we knew each other. We hadn't really made an association with each other as, you know, as men at this point. So now we, we, we meet and then fast forward about maybe four years, four, no, this is like 1986, 87 or so. I'm playing with his dad, with Ellis Marcellus, myself and Reginald Veal, who's on the bass. We're playing a trio gig at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. And so uh, Winston happened to be, you know, by that time, he, he had really, really made his name on the scene, on the jazz scene. He was very, very strong on the scene. So he was also playing that festival that same day. So when 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 Winton finished his set, he rushed over to the set, to the stage where where I was playing with his dad with Ellis, and he sat in with us. And so when he sat in, he sat in. He liked the feel of the rhythm section with myself and Reginald Veal. Nice. So he, he he really liked the feel of that rhythm section, and in doing so, uh, he talked to his dad later on and he said, "Man." I like the way those guys play, man. Do you mind if I call them to make some gigs with me? So his dad was like, yeah, man, I don't have any, any ties on anybody. They're all freelance musicians. You can call who you want. So about a year later or so, um, he calls Reginald Veal in about November of 87. Wow. And then um, and then February 88, he calls me. And we joined the band. And then I stayed with Winston for 17 years, playing in so many different kind of configurations. You know, from just he and I playing duo together to playing with a big band, to playing the septet to the quintet, playing with the, uh, the big band with a massive choir. And we did so many different kinds of collaborations together. And so, uh, so that was my association. I mean, and we're still to this day, we're still very, very good friends, very good friends, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's so amazing when I think about just the, the intensity of the stories and the great quality of music you played. You know, it's one thing about playing music is, is, is one thing, having fun playing music. But the quality of music you're playing with these musicians is at such a high level of expressiveness and musicality, dynamics, chord structure, form. I mean, you, you're in the thick of everything musical. <laughs> Well, you know, I think what I think is important is that when you find people who are like-mindedness, 
yeah. about the music, um, then you can have a, you really have a good dialogue and have you can have a good association. One thing is important is not to know that the music, this the art of jazz music is a living, breathing art form. Yeah, and it, you, it's always in a moment, and it's about it's about freedom, but it's also with, with, with about about being in control. You know, control, and and you know, you, you you're free, but you you you're within a context of a certain format, and so and and in and, and, and playing with other musicians, you know, we have to we, we allow each other to have to to express themselves, and you find your way to find to get into the conversation without being disruptive. So it's a it's a blend. You you're trying to find a blend, and oftentimes, you know. It's, it's different different kinds of contexts, different styles, but it's still at the core of what we're doing. It's about having a dialogue and having having uh, a, a give and take situation with the musician that you're playing with. And oftentimes, you know, when, when you find that, then the music can rise to a, a higher level. When you find guys who are playing who just want to stroke their own ego yeah. and just want to just you know just be about themselves, then the music really really suffers because it's not about that. The music is really about Having humility to come together and to and having humility to allow each, to, to allow other voices to speak, while while you still you know you're speaking your voice too, but having a, the humility to listen to to be able to listen to them and to find your way to 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 have a blend or a conversation with them, and I and, and most times when you know when the music gets to a higher level, that's you 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 always find that going on. Yeah. Boy, you know that, that's so. That's such great advice that you're speaking of. You know, and it's such an important part of of the understanding of our purpose as musicians. Yes. You know yes. That, that's that's really huge. You know, we got a couple of things here. First, of all, let me just show this here. This is let me see if I can show this here. Jeff Hamilton, you're too kind. I was glued <laughs> to what you were doing. <laughs> well. Well, you see that, that that's that's about the, that exchange we were talking about, man. We that, that exchange, you know, we were talking about. I appreciate Absolutely. that, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much, man. Fantastic. Now we got a, I got a question here that I want you, I want to go by here. This is a, a wonderful drummer, Carlos Goodsman, who's a phenomenal player in the Miami area, and he also is a a great player, and also a great you know drum set tech. He works with many of the top drummers like Max Weinberg and and Jerry Brown and Russ Miller, all these great, great players. But he's got a question. He said, great stories. Just like in Latin drum set playing, there are certain rhythms that you wouldn't play to be stylistically correct in that genre. With your upbringing and experience in second line playing, can you briefly explain the common mistakes young drummers usually make when they try and play second line rhythms on the drum set? Carlos, thank you so much. Well, that's that's a great question, Carlos. And unfortunately, you know, um, I can't really answer that in really in depth because um, without without hearing without hearing the particular drummer play, there are so many different versions of of, of concepts of that ideas people think that they have of playing a second line groove. One thing is that you know is you don't play a lot of you don't play a lot of triplets. The only time a triplets kind of come into a play is, is that at the end of a solo. Ta 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 ta, bang! But you don't you don't hear you don't hear you don't hear that kind of stuff. So you don't hear a lot of triplets played in, in, in the second line groove. Um, and 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 one of the things that one of the things that I, I can tell you one thing is that you know in the second line groove pretty much has to deal with it 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 it, it you know it comes from the march it comes out of a march. Yeah. Pretty much it has to deal with it comes from a march it comes out of a march and when you play a solid one and three on the bass drum, and then you got to play the big four every other beat. One, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, boom, 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 boom. So when you when you have that march in it, and you you find people that who and it's not always fast. It's not fast. It's a it's it's like a strut tempo. It's a it's a tempo that you use to strut, and you know. So people are walking, so you walk, you walk at a certain tempo. You don't walk, no, no, no. You walk, you walk at a at a moderate strutting kind of tempo, yeah. and and it's anchored by the bass drum. It's anchored by the, the bass drum on one, three, and the big four at the at the second second measure. Yeah. So that's the anchor. 
So when you have when, when that's at the foundation, then you can kind of embellish and do other things with that. But that always has to be at the foundation of the music. And so uh, it's hard for me to, to 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 recognize the mistakes that guys make because I don't study it like that. I, I, look, I don't look for the mistakes. I look for the good things in the music. And yeah. So, you know, if I hear if I hear somebody playing it, then I could probably kind of pick it apart and say, well, you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that. But just uh, uh, commonly speaking, um, I just can't I can't identify all the mistakes that that someone would be playing, you know, and trying to trying to emulate that style. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. But it's it's listen. The whole second line thing is such a a cultural, you know, a poignant style. You got to be down there. You got to be living it. You got to be eating the freaking gumbo. You got to really understand what the lifestyle is about to be able to feel, you know, the the heat and the humidity. All that kind of comes into play into that's the style right. of how all the music happens. That's right. That's right. You got to drink some of the Mississippi water too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Now, tell me about we we got some, we got a little time here. Just tell me about Mapex drums. I mean, you've been playing Mapex for a while. You know, how are you enjoying the drums and all these different playing situations? I really love Mapex drums, man. They, uh, you know, I was I, I guess I've been playing Mapex drums since like 1992, yeah. and um, and in playing the drums during that time, I was kind of reluctant. A friend of mine turned me on and said, "Man." You know, there's a there's a there's a drum company that's called Mapex, man. I said, what? Mapex? May, what is Mapex? I said, man, you know, they're, they're not like like some of these other companies like Yamaha, or Gretsch, or, or Pearl, or you know, or, you know, they were in a Premier. Even Premier was was popular at, at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mapex was kind of like just getting off the ground at the time, and and so. Uh, I said, okay, well, let, you know, give me the guy, give me, the, give me the numbers. Let's see if I can reach out and get an endorsement, you know. And so I did, and um, and I tell you, man, I, I, Mapex drums have served me well. They're great drums. They they great with, I can, you, you know, you can tune. They hold the tuning. They they're well built. Um, the hardware is, is 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 great. It's very solid. Um, and also I've had experiences where where you know I I've had. I was been able to. I needed. I needed drums, and they were available. I, you know, recording sessions in New York. I did. You know, I had some drums already at Lincoln Center that was already there. But I needed. I needed a drum set yeah. for for a couple of recordings. I did. I called down to Mapex Drums, and they they had someone from SIR to, to deliver some Mapex drums to me, and uh, they asked what size you want. So they were able to get get all the sizes that I need, and um, and over the years, man, whatever whenever I've called the company. For anything, they, they've always reciprocated and, and was able to to, to uh, fulfill my request. Yeah. Did you work with Joe Hibbs? Yes. Oh, I man, he was a great guy, man. Oh. Great, great, lovely human being, man. Great, lovely. I miss Joe Hibbs. I miss yeah. him. He, he passed away too soon. Yeah, he sure did. He loved your playing, man. We used to talk about you all the time. Joe was a friend of mine for over forty years, and just uh, you know, we do. We just we just love talking about you and just your your feel and your style. It was just so so great. Now, yeah. tell me about just tell me about some of your your as a leader. Now, listen, you're doing something when you bring in these young musicians. The same thing that Art Blakey did when he brought in these young musicians. Watch what you're doing that you recorded, the Cream of the Crescent. New, dire new, new, new direction, and then perpetual optimism. I mean, you really got some great, great music that you surround yourself with as a leader. Yeah, well, well, you know, that was pretty much my goal was to kind of pattern my my my, my leading my, my drumming leading style after Art Blakey mm -hmm. to to hire younger musicians who 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 are up and coming who who, are, who could really play and to um, to enhance my music. And so that's what I I, was, I got very very lucky. And uh, it's hard to get these guys now, man, because I got Emmett Coyne, who's, you know, great, great pianist and plays organ right now. He's he's in Europe right now, man. So, wow. I have, so I, you know, and then Russell Hall, who's a bassist, young bass player. He's, um, and then I had Bruce Harris and then Godwin Louis. Beautiful. They're all phenomenal young musicians. Yeah. Um, and so I was able, I was very, very blessed to be able to get them to record my music, not only to record, you know, I I I'm, I I write music, but I'm not as I'm not as um. In my writing, sometimes I have some little flaws and little you know, you know, and being able to identify certain chords. I have I hit I hear the sounds 
I hear sounds. And I'll write the notes with I on on the, on the staff paper and say, "Well, this is this is the, this is the chord. This is the sound I'm hearing. Here, here are the notes." Yeah. But these guys kind of put together. Oh, say, oh man, that's a that's a that's an alter chord, or that's a that's a E flat sus, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just an E flat sus inverted or whatever. They, they might tell me what they might identi they identify. It. So so it's a fair exchange, and, and I, I I know in doing that, um, I also. Ex you know, they asked me about some of my experiences as is over the years. So we have we have a wonderful exchange. They kind of helped me with my music. I kind of helped them with some things in life, as far as you know, having a marriage and having relationships and and yeah. um, you know, the experiences that I've had with, with in, in association with different musicians. You know, so it's a fair exchange. You know, they they you know, and and so um, I was very very lucky. To have these guys and not only that not only are they great musicians they're great human beings they're wonderful people to be around i did a tour i did a gig in um in Bern, switzerland where i where we all went to burn together and man and these musicians man i would actually i would leave them up i would go to bed like one o'clock in the morning after the gig we finished the show and i'd go to bed and they'd still be sitting up in the lobby downstairs in the hotel, just talking and exchanging and, and, and really enjoying each other's company. And so when you have when you have musicians really who um, who really enjoy they, each other's company and being around each other, it really shows up in the music. No. It shows up in the music because this is about a human experience. It's not just about a musical. It's about a, the experiences of, of different spirits coming together and, 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 and really blending. And so uh, I got very, very lucky that these guys really, really like each other. And well, that's so fantastic that you, you you create such a wonderful, positive. I mean, this is perpetual optimism at its best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it absolutely. really is. We have a question from a from a, a young drummer here, and uh, let's see if I can pull this up here. Uh, come on, where's the where's the question here? Let's see. What's why is it not coming up here? Come on, let's please. See. He said he wants to know about the second line. Uh, well, I, his question. I, 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 for some reason, I can't. I can't seem to pull it up. Can you? Can you see there that? Was, there was, please ask her about the tamarind and how it's integral to the New Orleans second line. Yeah, you see that, right? There it is. I, I see it. Let me get a tamarind. I'll just give you a, a quick demonstration. All right, cool, man. Yeah. Look at this here. All right, Menachem Ben Egon. Thank you so much, Dom. Please ask Herlin about the tamarind and how it's integral in the New Orleans second line. The New Orleans second line. Check this out here. So, Thank you. so uh, the second line, the second line rhythm is boom, 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 boom. That's the that's the bass drum, and then the uh, and so and so so this I'll play the rhythm, the kind of rhythm that that that's played on on the snare drum, boom, 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 boom. That's, that's pretty much that, and um, my style of temp, how I play is it, di directly associated with associated with playing, growing up and playing in the church. Yeah, in the gospel church. So, so that's where I get that's where I get this whole the whole style of the tambourine. And and fortunately, when I played with Winton's band, Winton he 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 when he brought me to the band, he said, "Man, bring everything you got." So man, so I brought. Everything I had to the to, to the table, my my association with playing. When I told you about playing, one more time I played the washboard. So I played. I brought the washboard to the band. I played in Latin bands around New Orleans. So I brought cowbells to the band. Um, I played the tambourine. So the, the tambourine kind of kind of has taken on a life of its own. Yeah, sure. And so um, so he began to write music for me that featured me playing the tambourine, and now it's become like a, a signature for me. Now playing the, the tambourine, so uh, and I, I so I have to give Winton the credit for um, for 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 really really encouraging all the musicians to to play to to bring whatever you had to the table and to create music with it, you know. And uh, it was just like myself and Wycliffe Gordon's another one, man. Wycliffe Gordon played the trombone with Winton, and Wycliffe plays like a, a a slide trumpet now. He plays a slide trumpet. 
he plays a tuba, he plays um he plays all kinds of things, but and he, he does all kinds of tricks with the with, with the with the with the horn where he plays blows harmonics and stuff inside the the, the uh the trombone or, or the uh where he, he hums hums another note and plays. So all these kinds of little things, man. Reginald Veal one time he was we were playing and Reginald Veal played um he played the bass. But he had went and got some Chinese food and he had a rubber band that was attached to a piece of plastic. And he started playing this this rubber band over this plastic thing, man. It's like, well, what is that, Rich? <laughs> so it was just, but it's about being expressive. Yeah. And, and using whatever you have to, to 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 be expressive and try to incorporate it into into the music where you that you're playing it, you know. I play at a club here in New Orleans called Snug Harbor. Snug Harbor has a big pipe that sits to my left. And and when I'm playing at Snug, you know, I always incorporate that pipe into some kind of solo. <laughs> when I play. And, it, and it's a, it's it's a, it's a weird kind of thing because it's 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 a it's a it's a pipe that it's a water pipe. It's about three inches, and when I hit it, it sounds like sounds like a pipe. <laughs> but, you know, but but somehow or another, you can still be creative and, and, and make music on that. You know. Well, you are you're playing the pipes, you're playing the walls, you're playing. You know, my, 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 this is so fantastic. Even the washboard, you make sure you don't get your wife angry that you're starting to take some stuff from the house. <laughs> well. I might, I might borrow a couple of pot tops, but you don't ever know. <laughs> <laughs> Herlin, it is fantastic to have some time with you. You really are an absolute legend. You're a wonderful, wonderful person. And it's just so great to have this, this time with you too on behalf of Mapex All Access and all the different drummers that have joined us. We have had drummers that have joined us from all around the world. This was live on Facebook and live on YouTube. But when we finish this recording, it'll go on to Mapex Drums Facebook page. So everyone go out there and Sign up to Mapex Drums Facebook page, and you can go to Mapex Drums YouTube channel. It'll be there for all of us to share on social media. Herlin, you have been an absolute saint, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dom. Dominic, thank you so much, brother. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm glad we were able to make up from last week. We did it, man. And listen, you were recording last week. So listen, anytime <laughs> we lose an interview for a recording session, that's a good <laughs> thing, man. We'll take that for sure, man. Thank you so much. Stay well. Be safe. And hopefully at some point I'll get down to New Orleans. I want to see you down there, man. We'll hang out for sure. I hope so, brother. Take care, man. Thanks God so much. Bye. All right. Peace and love.